Good Wednesday afternoon. It is September 20th and early this morning before the sun came up in Puerto Rico, we saw the third landfalling category four hurricane. The first time that that has ever happened. Three separate category four hurricanes making a US landfall and this had devastating effects in southeastern Puerto Rico. It made landfall earlier on right near Yabucoa Bay. We saw some gusts there of 130 miles per hour. The only good thing that kind of deterred this storm from strengthening further was it moved over the southeastern part of Puerto Rico. Very mountainous, high terrain there. High terrain, any land interaction, always detrimental to any you know, tropical system that's trying to get itself organized. And that certainly hurt it just a little bit. You notice the well-defined eye before landfall, then moving over land, that interaction there slightly weakened it. Still held on to a category four status that entire time. Now the center of circulation has emerged back over open water over the north side of Puerto Rico. Warm, warm water there. So fuel is back available. That engine going to get cranking yet again, and we'll likely see another I kind of get itself going here within the next 12 to 24 hours. Here's a close up look near Yabucoa Bay where it made landfall earlier this morning. We had lots of observation sites up that gave us some wind surface wind speeds here upwards of 110 115 within that we saw some other reports of 130 but notice one by one each reporting station was knocked offline. They briefly report calm winds which obviously wasn't happening during a category four hurricane and then just nothing. Yeah, we also had radar for a time, mainly well ahead of landfall. And these are the last few images before this went black. Radar site also blown out there. The radar site was about 12 miles inland from where the hurricane actually made landfall. So that's been knocked offline. Not sure if the tower itself lost power or there was some sort of issue with damage to the Doppler radar. Not sure yet, but they'll get an assessment of that once the winds uh, calm down. So here's another look at it. Just a beast of a storm. And earlier on, it had a very well-defined eye. In fact, I want to show you something here with a visible satellite imagery. You'll notice early on here, yesterday afternoon and evening, had a very small, well-defined eye called a pinhole eye. And we see this and we go, uh oh, that's usually a precursor to a very strong or strengthening storm. And that was evident, proven here with a Hurricane Hunter aircraft that went into the storm quickly thereafter and found the central pressure of 906 millibars. That surpassed the strength of Irma in terms of the central pressure. Obviously, the winds were a little bit stronger with Irma, but this a deeper storm. Irma only dropped to 914 millibars. To give you some bearing, the lowest pressure on record in the Atlantic was Wilma. That was 882 millibars. Tenth lowest on record there in the Atlantic Basin. All right, here's the latest numbers on it as of the advisory earlier this morning. 140 mile per hour winds. When it made landfall, winds were sustained around 160 or so. So it did lose a little bit of that steam. Still seeing gusts upwards of that. Now back over open water and it's expected to maintain itself as a category four for the next several days. A major hurricane even before it gets downgraded to a category three by early in the morning on Sunday, still a major hurricane before it moves into slightly cooler waters and also has some sort of an influence and it's steering with Jose. Yeah, that's still out there too. All right, let's talk about what's going on with terms of this cone of uncertainty. You've heard us talk about this time and again with each storm that comes on through uh, the Atlantic. Well, the cone of uncertainty basically encompasses the track, the center of the storm system. A lot of these storms, four, five, six hundred miles in diameter. So even though the center of it may stay within that forecast cone, the outermost bands could certainly make it close to the eastern seaboard. It could track along that westernmost fringe of the cone, or it could do the opposite, track along the farthest eastern, or go right down the middle there. Hurricane Center says it stays within that cone about two thirds of the time. All right, what are the models doing with this? A lot of these very good consensus. We'll start with the GFS ensemble. This is one model run 20 separate times with different initializations or so different settings, different wind speeds, that sort of deal to give some sort of an outcome. Very good consensus here. Only a deviation of maybe 50, 100 miles in either direction. That's good for that far out in the forecast period. Why? Well, something happens here called atmospheric memory where Jose, which made a very similar path, kind of opened up a weakness in the upper level wind patterns that steer these storms. So likely Maria will kind of catch a ride on 
say the wake of Jose as it moves due north. Very similar path, but not exactly. So that's why we still have some uncertainty in how far east or west it will go. All right, here's the other tropical models here indicating more of the same, a sharp northwards turn somewhere to the west of Bermuda and to the east of the eastern seaboard. Again, that's offshore, but still too close for comfort. And there's still that unknown. What the factor of influence will be from Jose. Longest lived named storm in the Atlantic. Still a named tropical storm, Jose, 14 days now, going on 15 days, surpassed Irma as the longest lived named storm of the year. And that moves generally off to the northeast a little bit farther, but then just kind of hangs out in this general area, waiting for Maria to catch up and finally meet it. All right, here's the atmospheric setup. We're looking at that strong ridge that's captured Jose for the time being and helping it to kind of meander and do a clockwise turn similar to what it did when it was south of Bermuda last week. Now that also does something off to the ridge, the ridge of high pressure that's been steering Maria this whole time. That weakens that, so that allows Maria to jog northwards, and eventually once they get close enough, something called the Fujiwara effect comes into play. Take note of that. You're probably going to be hearing that headline time and again as we get closer to the early part of next week. This is something that's extremely rare especially in the Atlantic Basin, but it's come up a time or two, and it certainly may as we go into Tuesday and Wednesday of next week off the eastern seaboard somewhere. So by that point, Jose will be likely a low-grade tropical storm, or maybe just a remnant low. All you need is that low-pressure circulation there for the interaction. Maria, obviously the dominant of the two, still likely a hurricane at that time. They get within a certain distance of one another, and their overall circulation start to interact. They start to orbit around each other in a counterclockwise manner around a centralized point. And eventually, that distance between the two closes. The stronger of the two, Maria, will eventually absorb the remnant low there, possibly adding strength to the system itself. But this also interaction will likely help it get deflected on out to sea there. If it does, in fact, absorb it, there may be some more issues that we'd have to worry about along the eastern seaboard there. So we have to watch exactly how that plays out. Hasn't been a whole lot of instances of it that we can really study to see what might happen. So it's going to be something we watch over the next couple of days. All right, that's all we got now. We'll watch it. We'll watch Maria as it heads back over towards the Bahamas coming up later today and tomorrow. Until then, try to enjoy your afternoon. And you can also join the conversation on social media. Find me on Facebook, meteorologist Tim Pandagis, or on Twitter at 13 Tim Pandagis.